thank you everyone for joining us today. We're going to get started in just a minute here. So if you're tuning in live, just hang tight. We will be uh, starting in just a moment. Okay, happy World Ocean Day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Today we are connecting live on Google Hangouts to celebrate the Earth's ocean with a trifecta of science and exploration. I'm so glad that we can be joined today by some of the top exploration research vessels connecting together for the first time. With us today is Ocean Exploration Trust, EV Nautilus, in the North Pacific waters, NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer and the Mariana Trench Monument, which is about 400 nautical miles northwest of Guam, and Schmidt Ocean Institute's research vessel Falkor in the South China Sea off the coast of Vietnam. In the next 40 minutes, we're going to give you a sneak peek into the different research expeditions that we are currently conducting. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our team today, our special guests. I'll start with Mimi, uh, who is joining us from NOAA ship Okeanos. Mimi is uh, down here on the left. And Mimi comes with uh, 20 cruises of experience, and she is a physical scientist with NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. Over on Nautilus, we have Nicole, who is the expedition leader and director of science operations, and Rachel, a science communications fellow with Ocean Exploration Trust. And this is, uh, we have Rachel there and Nicole. And then last but certainly not least, we have on Falcor, Monica, who is the multimedia journalist on board, Joseph Montoya, who is our chief scientist uh, from Georgia Tech, and our lead marine technician, Leighton. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you could make it. All right. Thank you. So it's good to be here. <laughs> it's good to have everyone here. <laughs> World Ocean Day is all about encouraging individuals to think about what the ocean means to them and what we can do for our ocean. And I cannot think of a more perfect way to celebrate than connecting three different research vessels in unique locations across the world. So we're going to get right started right away here. Uh, Mimi on the Okeanos. First, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you guys are doing and the type of discoveries that you have been able to make on the Okeanos? Okay, well, the cruise that we're on right now is one of three cruises that we are conducting in the Mariana Trench Marine National Monument and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, we are conducting these cruises from April 20th to July 10th. Uh, we are on the third to last day of this cruise, and we are in the northwest corner of the Mariana Monument. Uh, we've been mapping the seafloor uh, down to 6,000 meters, looking for interesting features to science um, that have not been discovered yet. So we've been looking for mud volcanoes and new hydrothermal vents uh, with the hope of contributing to the understanding of the geologic context of the area and also to provide baseline information to choose RV dive targets for our upcoming cruise. Excellent. Well, that's a great summary. Thank you so much. And let's uh, jump over to Nautilus, uh, Rachel and Nicole. Tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing, and also why is exploration so important? Sure. So um, right now we are off the coast of Oregon, and um, we are looking at methane seeps and different environments that are associated with those seeps. Uh, it's been a very interdisciplinary cruise uh, in that we are uh, exploring with our multi-beam system, including water column data to look for active seeps while we're uh, coming up with dive sites. So it's sort of on-the-fly planning and exploration. Um, and we have a multidisciplinary team on board of biologists who are interested in the organisms that are associated with those seeps, chemists who are taking samples of the gases and the rocks, uh, carbonate rocks that are associated to look at uh, the chemical composition of these things, and also geologists who are interested in this area that is um, very seismically active and you know right off the coast of our United States. So um, we've been working in these waters for about a week now, and we'll continue for another uh, until June 19th. Yeah, and ocean ocean exploration is so important for for many reasons, and uh, one of them really is is that 
the Nautilus really takes into account the Ocean Exploration Trust really holds important is encouraging the next generation of scientists. So that's something that, as well as the science exploration that the ship's doing, one of its other key features is really exciting the, the next generation of scientists, uh, engineers, uh, on to, to start exploring the oceans. So uh, yeah, we have a great program. So as part of all that inter interdisciplinary scientists, uh, science is going on, we have interns from, from all around the world that are coming in to, to see how research is done on the, uh, in the oceans. And of course, ocean exploration is so important because of how little we know out there. And, and Nicole knows uh, heaps about the maps. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I mean, so uh, you know, just the, the ocean being 70% of our planet, it's important to explore that. And the first step, and certainly most of uh, what we're doing is mapping. Um, we have less than about 11% of the seafloor has been mapped with the sonar systems that are equipped on all three of these exploration vessels. Um, so it's uh, important that we map the seafloor first and then uh, you know, collect the representative information, uh, oceanographic data, samples, uh, video imagery, so that we can better understand uh, the resources and uh, things like habitats that we need to protect. Excellent. Thank you, ladies. And let's uh, turn over to software. Why don't you share a little bit about what you guys are doing and also tell us why science can help conservation or why is science so important for conservation? Well, good morning, Carly, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we're currently off the coast of Vietnam. Um, we're studying the alpha flow of the Mekong Delta and how um, nitrates and various other substances are being pushed out into the South China Sea and support life there. Well, the question is, how can science, how can a ship like the Falco help um, understand the environment? Every time this ship leaves the Earth, every time we sail out to sea, we find something new, um, albeit something small or something big. Falco's been involved in a lot of projects. We found big seamounts down in the Mariana Trench, um, which hadn't previously been seen before. We've gone up and we found the world's deepest fish at around 8,000 meters. Every time a ship like this goes out, every time we turn our sonar on, every time we put our sensors on and study the chemical composition of the ocean, we make important contributions to our understanding of the planet. And it's people like us, people like the Nautilus, the Okeanos Explorer, various other ships heading out there and doing that science. And I mean, Falco's a really uh, capable ship of doing, uh, of doing exactly that. But why do we do it? Well, we need to better understand the ocean finding all these reasons why the Mekon is seed in the South China Sea, finding out why fish live at 8,000 meters. In order to become better stewards of our planet, we have to first need to understand it. And being out here at the forefront of that is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leighton. Uh, that was a great introduction, everyone. And I want to talk a little bit more about the research vessels themselves. Each ship is unique and specializes uh, in different facilities. So let's uh, first go over back to Rachel and Nicole. Tell us a little bit about Nautilus, the ship, and the type of uh, work that Nautilus has been able to do in the past. Yeah, definitely. So I think one of the main differences is, is even just going to the title of the different ships that we have. So uh, the Nautilus is an exploration vessel. So I know the other two are RVs. Uh, we are an EV, so we're an exploration vessel. And uh, so uh, how we go about uh, the science exploration that we do is probably a little bit different. And the technology we have, like the other ships, is, is pretty awesome, I must say. As someone coming new into this, uh, only been doing this a couple of years, it's uh, really exciting. Yeah, so I think um, one of the goals of Nautilus has always been to explore the unknown parts of the deep sea. Um, so with our tandem pair of ROVs, uh, Hercules and Argus, we try to go to the depths um, that other people haven't been able to reach, to sites that people haven't explored before, and gather the first bits of information on a place um, that might have something really exciting and worth coming back to uh, with you know, a research vessel to do further exploration for further research. Um, really gathering that first uh, bit of information, the samples, the data that allow scientists to come back with a funded research cruise uh, with research um, hypotheses to conduct on, on other vessels is um, you know, one of the goals of the vessel. Along with that, we try to integrate as many new sensors and technologies on our ROVs and on the ship as we can to um, make use of the time that we have at sea. So our ROV has uh, 
really nice system where you can sort of plug and play with different systems. So scientists will bring out new sampling gear. Um, on this cruise, in, for example, we're using gas pipe samplers to sample the methane bubbles. Um, on the next cruise, we'll be plugging in an EEG sensor to get a live uh, EEG reading up to the, the ship. So um, really trying to make the most of the exploration while we're here and, and working with a team of scientists from around the globe. Uh, really, we try to engage as many different scientists uh, in many different types of science, and including in maritime heritage, as possible to make sure that no matter what we come across, we have a team on shore uh, as well as on the ship who are equipped to deal with those uh, things that we discover. And the side effect of that means that we can use that technology, that telepresence technology, to let viewers at home live stream the science research, science exploration that we're doing and join in with the conversation. So at NautilusLive.org, we've got a live stream uh, that's going 24-7 while we're out in, out in the sea. And uh, viewers can write questions to us. And then uh, one of my jobs on the ship is to send those questions or pass those questions along in conversation to the scientists and the um, uh, the engineers on board on watch that time and get them to answer questions. So it's really fantastic technology, the satellite technology that we're using to really get everyone to uh, join in with the exploration no matter where they are in the world. Well, it's just amazing to me too, we're covering the globe even today on this call, how much uh, space we have <laughs> over the ocean with the different uh, vessels joining. Let's uh, head over to Mimi again. Mimi, tell us a little bit about Okeanos and what makes Okeanos unique, and what are some of the challenges of doing science at sea? Okay, I would love to do that. Um, so we do have a lot of similarities with both the Nautilus and the Falcor in terms of our mapping systems. Um, we each have an EM302 multi-beam sonar, which is capable of mapping the seafloor down to about six or 7,000 meters. Um, I believe we all have the same sub-bottom sonar, which is a Knudsen 3.5 kilohertz sonar, which is designed to actually penetrate the seafloor and see if there are layers of, say, sediment or gas pockets underneath uh, the seafloor. And we all have EK60s, um, which are designed to see if there is anything in the water column, something like uh, schools of fish or seeps coming out of the seafloor. So we all operate these um, in tandem to see if we can find any new discoveries. So first first line of defense here is the baseline characterization of the seafloor and what's in the water column. So we all do that. Um, the Okeanos is the only federal ship dedicated to ocean exploration that makes us a little bit unique uh, in, the, in the trifecta here that we have today, which is great. Um, so the, the next stage after the baseline characterization with the mapping is the ROV exploration. So the Okeanos has two uh, remotely operated vehicles that can each go down to 6,000 meters. Um, the main vehicle is called Deep Discoverer. It has really nice video cameras on it. Um, they were recently upgraded and now they, I believe, are better than what the Super Bowl is filmed with uh, for live television. Um, and we also have some new um, sampling capabilities with our ROVs. So that's an exciting development for our program this year. Um, we started taking uh, biological and geological samples that are meant to represent either a new species. If we, if we think we knew a, see a new species, we take a sample. And if we think it's a, a new representation of a known species in a new area, we'll take that sample. So that's another thing we're doing here on the Okeanos. And then to bring it all telepresence capabilities. Um, so we are interacting with scientists on shore during all of our cruises, sharing our data with the public. Um, and we, uh, we work with scientists on shore to actually guide our ROV dives. So when they see something that is interesting, uh, they communicate with us on board, and they are literally asking us to go take a closer look at that coral. Or, for example, last year we found a sponge um, in the Papahanaumokuakea National Marine National Monument of Hawaii, and we were lucky to have the Falcors data from the year before. So with all of this open ocean data that, that sharing that we're doing, we were allowed to use their data find a really interesting place on the sea for to go, and we ended up finding what is now thought to be the largest sponge in the world, or at least the largest sponge ever discovered by scientists. So by, by doing all of the mapping and the sharing of the data and the ROV exploration and then sharing it with the public in real time, we have the best shot at making discoveries, um, which is overall our goal here on the Okanos Explorer. Um, as far as challenging uh, aspects of science at sea, 
you just you never know what to expect. You could have really bad weather, and that could impact your data quality. Sonars are very susceptible to bad weather. Um, anytime you have a ship uh, pitching and heaving and rolling, I don't know if you can see behind me on my screen right here. I tried to show a, a nice, it might be a little bright on my webcam, but we're having beautiful weather today, so our data is gorgeous. But if we have bad weather, we get bad data. Um, sometimes you have mechanical problems with your ships, um, which is, you know, these ships are aging, and the engineers do the best job they can, but you can't predict mechanical failure. Um, and I always put in there fresh food. I think it's fun to think about how much, how long can you keep a head of lettuce? For three or four weeks at a time, stewards are uh, doing their best to give us fresh food, but this ship is actually limited by food. That's why we go in. We're not limited by water or fuel. We are actually limited by food, fresh food. So that's life out here on the Okeanos. <laughs> that's always a challenging, making sure that there's fresh vegetables and fruit for long periods of time. And uh, I know I've had the pleasure of sailing on Falkor, and uh, the chefs really have it down to a science there. Let's go over to Falkor now. Leighton, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the technologies that are used on Falkor, uh, similar for sh to the other ships for sharing uh, data, and why is technology so important for exploration? Uh, I don't. I don't think I need to tell you, Kelly. Um, we're all sat here on a call between three ships in different parts of the world. And uh, if I thought about that when I first joined Oceanography ten years ago, I mean, this is really what is allowing us to target people. And as, as the other teams have said, not only are we able to target our science ashore using a VSAT connection and streaming our finds in real time, we can also target the general public. And, SOI um, streams a lot of its video to YouTube and that. And not only can scientists see it, the general public can watch. And that is one of the key things that technology allows us to do. At the end of the day, we're all with scientists who do a study of the oceans. The public are the biggest people who can protect the oceans and help the planet basically be better stewards of the oceans. So getting that video, showing people what's out there, and even showing the damage that we're causing is a great use of that technology. In addition, it isn't always for us about discovering new things. It's about understanding stuff which may have already been explored before. So, for example, we recently visited, uh, visited Scott Reef off Australia. It had been visited many times by um, other ships. But Falco was able to bring to bear a number of new technologies, um, new sensors to study that reef in detail that hadn't been studied before and make that available to the scientists. We were able to use our real to our supercomputer to um, do real-time models of idle inflow um, and understand where all the nutrients were being distributed, and then go there with an ROV and look at the corals and how they were being affected. So technology there using the supercomputer allowed us to buy models and see it in real time. And that's really important. Um, the other stuff, well, <laughs> technology um, helps us get to um, new depths. One of the most exciting things at the moment is we're building a, a new ROV, Sebastian, which should be coming online in, ooh, like in about a month's time. We'll be out in Guam testing it. And like the, like the ship, Sebastian is a platform to technology. We can add new sensors, as, as things evolve. And it's about keeping up to speed and about using the latest sensors to get the best data and help us understand the mechanics of the ocean and explore and see things. Excellent. And Leighton, right next to you is Dr. Joseph Montoya, who is the chief scientist uh, on the cruise right now, the Changing River Expedition. Joe, uh, can you tell us what you're looking for uh, in the South China Sea and what you guys have been doing for the past week? Well, Leighton provided a great intro. We're interested in what happens to the outflow of the Mekong plume as waters move offshore and begin to interact with the South China Sea waters. Uh, unlike what the Nautilus and the Okeanos Explorer are doing, we're very much focused on the water column and processes up near the surface, tending down to the bottom. These waters have not been uh, extensively studied, and we have this unique opportunity to look at the chemical and biological changes that accompany the Mekong plumes offshore and mix it with the surrounding ocean. Leighton mentioned a fertilization effect. There is, we already know, a critical change in the biological communities in response to the, the input of, of terrestrial nutrients 
and terrestrial water. We're trying to understand how this part of the ocean works, what the impact on productivity on fisheries might be, both of the river in its current state and the river in the state that it's likely to, to move into as land use changes, dam construction, and extensive mariculture begin to occur in Vietnamese coastal uh, regions. We are at an early stage in these, in these changes, and we're providing critical ground truthing of the state of the system before it really begins to be affected by these changes. So it's a unique opportunity for us to have an international team of scientists. Uh, there are Americans on board, uh, Europeans, and a group of Vietnamese colleagues carrying out this multidisciplinary and very collaborative study of what goes on in coastal and offshore waters off Vietnam. I'm delighted to be here and are having a wonderful time. Well, it's been exciting to watch what's going on with some of the video blogs that you guys have been producing. Uh, it's been really interesting to see the work that's going on. Uh, Rachel and Nicole, you guys are on the other side of the ocean conducting the seeps and ecosystems of the Cascadia margin cruise. I know uh, we briefly gave an introduction at the beginning of this hangout, but um, can you tell us a little bit more about your plans for the next couple of weeks? I know you're going to be doing some ROV diving and mapping. Tell us more. Sure, so um, we're actually on Colm Ridge right now and we're planning to do an ROV dive in the next 24 hours to look at an ancient uh, seep site. It has a nice carbonate cap on it and uh, it's a ridge that was um, named after a scientist from Oregon State who's going to be participating for sure, so it'll be exciting to have him uh, join in remotely. After that, we're hoping to go back to Astoria Canyon because the um, seeps that we discovered there were much more extensive than we were anticipating. And so there were um, seeps that were actually in, within the canyon proper, uh, and then some seeps up uh, on in the escarpment of the, of the canyon. And, and they had uh, extensive plant communities, uh, gastropods, uh, and bacterial mats. And we want to go back and uh, more fully explore those two zones of uh, methane seeping. After that, we're planning to map um, south for a couple of days. So we're, as I mentioned, off the coast of Oregon now, and um, we end up in San Francisco at the end of this cruise. So we're going to map along the 500-meter contour line where uh, we believe there's a higher incidence of seeps. Um, other scientists have, have seen this, and so with our sonar system, we'll be looking for, for more seeps and potentially diving on a couple of those. Um, and then, uh, looking at coral communities along ridges off of uh, Northern California as well. So there are a series of these north-south ridges um, that are potential coral habitat, and so um, we're hoping to take a closer look at those. And finally, uh, we might actually look at the eel fan, which Okeanos Explorer uh, found a mega seep on in uh, their mapping trials back uh, a decade ago now, I believe. So um, we're hoping to maybe follow up on an unexplored portion of that Area. Yeah, and then for the rest of the season, we're going to keep heading down uh, down California and around the Channel Islands as well, and checking out the marine sanctuaries down there, and really just documenting uh, the habitat down there and, and what levels uh, produce what sort of habitat and living conditions, and seeing whether those sanctuary boundaries need to be extended, which we successfully did last year in the Galapagos. We were uh, checking around the marine sanctuary there, and, and the amount of life that we saw down there showed that that sanctuary needed to be uh, wider than it was. So uh, that's really exciting, and, and we'll be doing similar stuff this year. Amazing work, ladies. That's fantastic. <laughs> Mimi, let's uh, talk about Okeanos. Why Mariana Trench Monument, and what's the uh, importance of being able to do research in some of these protected areas? Uh, that's a great question, um, and I, I think the immediate answer is that we can't manage what we don't know. Um, these waters are so deep, and there's so little known about them. They are a marine protected area, which is great, but we don't know exactly what is here yet. Um, so we are here to create the first line, uh, first baseline information about these deep water areas. You can think about marine these marine national monuments in the Pacific, kind of like national park. Uh, they are the public good, are important to understand in terms of fisheries, um, minerals, things that could be important to medicine, um, things that could be important to new technologi technological developments, um, but we can't manage what we don't know. So what we're doing is putting the first level of information into the hands of decision makers. 
um, ensuring that the ocean is managed in a sustainable way. Um, we have these vast stretches of U.S. waters out here in the Pacific, and we really don't know what's what's in them yet. Um, some isolated areas of these protected areas are understood to a certain extent, but they're so vast, um, it's it's them. So by creating information and getting that to the hands of the scientists and the and the managers that can really digest the information and make wise resource decisions on the information, um, we're providing that information to the public and a service to the public. Um, and really, there aren't that many people exploring our global oceans. Um, we're the only federal exploring the ocean, and luckily now we have the FALCOR and the Nautilus has been doing this for quite some time, um, and we're all working together to try to get this information into the hands of the right people. Um, and as, as we continue to build these protected areas, a, a number of them out in the Pacific were recently expanded. We have all of these new areas uh, within U.S. waters to explore, which is exciting um, for the Oceanos. Excellent. And Mimi, in all that um, time, the 20 cruises that you've helped to lead or participate in, uh, can you think of any time where you've really been um, floored or something that's really surprised you when you've been out at sea during uh, these exploration expeditions? I'm sorry, you're breaking up. Sorry, I'll repeat the question. I just missed that question. The, the signal broke up. That's okay. The question was, okay. uh, have you ever been really floored in all the times you've been out to sea, or has there any been a time where you've been really surprised during any of these exploration expeditions where you've just uh, been shocked by something that you've seen? Yes. Um, yes. I, it happens. Sometimes it's kind of an after-the-fact uh, surprise, but I think for me, um, the biggest surprise was in the Gulf of Mexico. I think it was in 20. 14. Um, we were expecting to be diving on a shipwreck. Um, it was a target that was seen in um, actually an oil industry data that was shared with NOAA because they thought they saw a shipwreck and they are required as part of their lease permits to share information. They think they see um, features of uh, historical radar dive plan on this supposed shipwreck, but we ended up finding um, something called an asphalt extrusion. Um, and it looked like a giant, we called it a tar lily, it looked like a giant flower. It was, uh, I think it was three, three to four meters across. Um, and it was just sitting out there all by itself, totally unknown. Uh, they were, this kind of extrusion is not known to exist in the Gulf of Mexico. I believe there were instances of this kind of feature in other parts of the world, but certainly never in the Gulf of Mexico. But since we were sharing all of the real-time video feeds, um, live, we were able to kind of switch to the science team on shore and say, okay, archaeologists, like, sorry, we thought we were going to find a shipwreck today, but actually we found something of geological interest. So we called in a whole different set of people to work with on shore. This, this is the scientist on call or doctor on call concept. Um, so that was actually really, really interesting to see just how the whole dive just kind of morphed from an archaeology dive to a geology dive in the course of you know, a half an hour once we finally got to the sea floor that day. So that was really interesting. And another one that I just love, uh, which was kind of an after-the-fact surprise, was as we're conducting these these mapping expeditions over time um, on the East Coast, we had, I think, seven mapping cruises on the East Coast running along the continental shelf break. So about 100 miles offshore, your continental shelf turns into your continental slope and then it goes down into the deep ocean. And all along the continental shelf of the US, um, from say, North Carolina, Virginia area, all the way up to really the Canadian border, there are methane, or thought to be methane seeps coming out of the seafloor that were completely unknown to science. Uh, we were aware of two seeps off of North Carolina, um, and we ended up finding over 500 seeps in that zone from North Carolina to Canada. Um, with our multi-beam sonar. And that took time. That took, um, like I said, seven cruises and digestion of the data to really see what was going on there. And it's opened up this whole new field of, of science um, on the East Coast because of the systematic exploration. So that was really, really neat. And that was kind of like a delayed excitement, but it was really amazing to see the whole project develop. 
Well, whether it's delayed or in real time, I think any time there's a discovery or new data that we're working with, everyone in our field and who joins along with us gets very excited. Uh, Rachel and Nicole, how about you? Has there, you know, in World Ocean Day, it's important to think about some of the experiences we've had with the ocean. Uh, has there been any aha or really wow experiences that you've been able to encounter so far? Yeah, I mean, sure. I think for me, the reason I love my job is because every time we come out here, we find something new and exciting. Um, a recent discovery, the Astoria Canyon has um, methane hydrates, and they weren't expecting to find that. That was a big surprise on the last dive we did. Um, but I think one that will stick in my mind forever was our exploration of the Galapagos Rift um, last year, where we had uh, some sites, some legacy sites, historical sites that we expected um, to look a certain way, um, active seeps or uh, with communities. And when we went down there, they were completely paved over with lava. Um, so to me, just being able to see over the span of maybe five years how much the sea floor can change uh, really brought home how alive the oceans are um, and how important it is that we are able to go and take a look at them. Yeah, and on that same uh, expedition, actually, there was this really, it wasn't like a big moment in science or anything, but it was a really small, beautiful moment for the team on watch and, uh, and all the viewers watching at home through Nautilus Live. Uh, it was, we found a flamboyant squid worm, which was documented only five years earlier and only existed outside the Philippines. And then we found heaps of them around the Galapagos Islands. And they're just beautiful to watch. They're just truly amazing worms. And uh, we, have, we had a little bit of time. We were just exploring. And uh, there was a beautiful flamboyant squid worm that kind of appeared in front of, the, uh, in front of the ROV. So we were sort of following that for a while. And then sort of the background came into view. And there was this 400 degree black smoker just behind the flamboyant squid worm, which was what we'd actually been looking for. So uh, I like to say we followed the worm to the uh, to the treasure, but um, yeah, so that was, that was a really nice moment. And of course, probably the most famous moment we had last year was the sperm whale that came and inspected the ROV as we were descending down uh, just to look at the things he was as well. So uh, it was a young uh, sperm whale that just wanted to check out the ROV and was there for about 20 minutes trying to figure out what strange alien life form had entered the oceans. Uh, so that, that, was, that was obviously a really great moment. And, uh, yeah. It's amazing when you get uh, surprised by something. When I was uh, watching and following along with the Falkor last uh, two years ago in December 2014, and we found the world's deepest fish at 8,143 meters, the ghost fish, I, that was a moment that I, I seeing that fish is just unbelievable. Now, Leighton, uh, on Falkor, you've had a couple aha moments yourself. You've made a few discoveries of new seamounts and have been able to participate in a lot of cruises. What stands out to you as the most uh, memorable ocean experience you've had thus far? There's, obviously, there's two polar opposites to this question. The first is, is the UR stuff, the, the amazing cool stuff. And I know this is my 92nd expedition, and every time we see a hydrothermal vent, it's like, wow, they're all unique, they're all different. But you look at the money we invest in exploring the ocean, and people talking about life on other planets, and how, how these life, these ecosystems may mirror what's in the, in the rest of the universe. So seeing this unique form of life is always a like, wow, that's what might be out there in the universe. And if we took say like the $15 billion or whatever we invest in uh, curiosity and explore our own planet instead of thinking about the oceans on another planet without understanding us, we'd make some great advances on Earth. Um, but that's about exploration. The biggest who are, um, well, it's human impact. And working in the Indian Ocean on a fear ship, it's seeing the damage that humans are causing to the planet. There's all this cool stuff we see, but sometimes you need a sober and wake up call. When we looked at sea mounts that had been trawled um, for fish, um, and we were looking for Red Ruffy, we saw one in a 40-day cruise, just one fish in an area where they used to be abundant. We saw ghost lines, we saw nets, we saw the impact of what is, you know, feeding humanity. And the stewards of the ocean, it was one of the most disturbing things that I saw. And it's getting that information out there. So even though we've seen some cool stuff, it's the bad stuff that we see sometimes that actually jogs people into doing it. And the pictures we saw from that cruise were, you can imagine the control room was really emotional at the time, and it was just 
sitting there seeing these discarded nets with fish still stuck in them on the seabed. And the whole point of, of you know today to try and make ourselves better with that, to become better stewards. So there are the cool stuff, the UR stuff we see, but we need to, you know, see the bad stuff as well and become better. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Lean. Monica, what about you? Uh, you've been on three cruises with Falkor now. Has there been anything that's really stood out in your mind? Well, I think for me, the, the, the surprise and the discovery is dual because on the one hand, I have nowhere the experience and the hours that, that all of you guys have uh, sailing. And so for me, just in the ocean, in every expedition, I always see something I haven't seen before. Uh, I remember in one expedition, we had dolphins following us around uh, at night while there was a phytoplankton that that oh, no, uh -huh. And so it was very dark, so you could only see like the, the like glowing stars in the shape of dolphins following the, with the ship, so that was beautiful. Um, the amount of stars that you see here every night, just that is completely different to what you would see when you're in a city. And then on the other hand, to be able to to see how scientists struggle and work and, they, and how amazing it is that they go and do their, their detective work to try and uh, figure out how the oceans work, for me that's like another line of, of Amazement and discovery, personally, every time I'm able to witness the, the just the challenge and the passion that goes into figuring out the smallest things that that, that control the, the ocean. Yeah. yeah. And and Joe, any what about you? You want to contribute a, a story or a memory or something that's really surprised you working out on the ocean? Well, as I said. I'm Mentioned. Most of my work involves studying the upper water column, but I have to say that uh, the, the moment that really sticks in my mind is special it was the first time I got to go down in a submersible. In the Gulf of Mexico, we were working in a methane hydrate system, and we dropped down to this platform where there was a big hydrate mound, tube worms everywhere, plants, bacterial mats, and it was as if I were on another planet. It was just a very special moment finally being personally immersed inside the environment and being able to see what it was like for organisms that lived down there. So on a personal level, that was very special. Uh, scientifically, my work really is what Monica mentioned. We spend tremendous amounts of time watching water drip through filters, which we then take home and uh, work up in our labs. So the day-to-day the -day work feels a little more mundane, but in fact what we can learn about the workings of the ocean uh, tell us on a fundamental level how the planet functions and what we're doing to it and how we might deal with these changes moving forward. You're, you're muted, Carly. Golly. You're muted. Thank you very much. From the science <laughs> to the exploration to really understanding human impact, it's all about uh, sh sharing our knowledge and education, and I I'm so happy that we've been able to do that today. Uh, I want to give an opportunity to everyone to share a little bit more about what they're going to be doing and where people can find uh, more information and more opportunities to learn about um, these cruises and expeditions and ships that we're doing. So I'll turn it over to Rachel and uh, Nicole first. Uh, where can people tune in and see more? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so um, where you can go is you can go to the Nautilus Live web website, which is nautiluslive.org. But I mentioned before about all the amazing uh, education and internship opportunities that are aboard the Nautilus that we work really hard to, to maintain and, and really encourage and inspire the next generation of scientists. So if there's anyone out there that wants to get aboard with the uh, on the EV Nautilus, please go to the oet.org website and there'll be lots of information there and applications will open uh, in the fall of this year. So uh, you've got oet.org, you've got nautiluslive.org to follow along with our live streaming and send, in us, send us some questions. And uh, we've also um, got our Twitter and Facebook and uh, Instagram as well. So if you want to see some great photos of the underworld, 
uh, that would be <laughs> at, uh, at Nautilus Live for Instagram. Uh, Twitter will provide dive, upload, a dive alert, so you'll know exactly when we're diving, which will be at EV Nautilus for Twitter. And of course, Facebook, it is just Nautilus Live. So check us out on all those sites and join us at Nautilus Live when we're next diving. How about you, Mimi? Uh, Okeanos, where can people get more? Well, for the for the rest of this year, we're going to continue our work in the Mariana Trench region, and then for the final uh, two cruises of this year, so happening at the end of July into August and then into September, near Wake Island, um, doing some ROV and some mapping exploration there, and then over the winter, the ship will be in port in Honolulu, um, and then right. Right starting in December or January, we're actually going to start our uh, 2017 field season back in the Pacific, um, continuing our capstone um, effort, which is campaign to address the Pacific Monument Science and Technology and Ocean Needs. Caps take us to new remote areas of the Pacific, so places that are uh, part of of U.S. territories or regions, but maybe maybe most of us haven't been heard before. Um, these include Kingman Reef, Jarvis Islands, and Johnston American Samoa, Rose Atoll Marine National Monument, and the Phoenix Islands Protected Area and Musician Seamount. So all of these are within the U.S., and many of us have never heard of them. So if you follow along with our cruises um, on oceanexplorer.noaa.gov or on the Facebook account for the Office of Ocean Explorer or search, you can learn about these parts of the U.S. that we know very little about. Uh, they're underwater parts uh, right now. And I also want to put in a plug for our internships as well. Um, the Okeanos over the last seven field seasons has mapped one million square miles of the sea, excuse me, square kilometers, one million square kilometers of the seafloor. And we do that largely in part with the help of our interns. They have one sitting over here right near me right now, Will Melly. Uh, she's from Puerto Rico and slash Maryland. Um, and our internship applications are opening up in um, December. So if you want to get involved and you're a student or a recent graduate, uh, please tune in announcement up. Well, similar to Okeanos and Nautilus, Falkor also has uh, student opportunities. We also have a new Artist at Sea program that we're very proud of. And uh, similarly, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Schmidt Ocean. Monica, our multimedia journalist on board, has been producing some amazing video updates. And we look forward to continuing to follow the crews. Um, and to close today, I just want to say thank you to all of our participants, Rachel and Nicole, Mimi, Joe, Leighton, and Monica. A special thanks to Allison Fundus and Katie Wagner for helping to organize uh, the call today. And of course, to Schmidt Ocean Institute, Ocean Exploration Trust, and NOAA Office of Exploration and Research. And most importantly, to everybody who's tuned in today, who took some time to learn more about our ocean exploration and research at sea. I think we've seen some uh, a lot of similar themes between the different organizations and ships and knowing that we need to keep exploring, educating, and protecting our oceans. So please remember to keep educating yourself about our ocean planet. We've given you lots of opportunities and places to go because every day should be World Ocean Day. Uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and uh, we hope to do this again soon. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Carly.